the idea was to build the there there. So yeah. you come here, where am I going to go? We have 15, well, eventually we'll have 25 restaurants and 200,000 square feet of retail. And all of that is walkable on cobblestone streets with no cars interrupting because we shove the cars underneath. Yeah, uh, and there's pedestrian bridges uh, that go that span the, the roadways over the top. So unlike Las Vegas Strip, where you go up the escalator, over the road, down the escalator, here the cars go under. So you, yeah. have, you don't have any steps. You don't have any escalators. You, it's all totally walkable. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the 435 Podcast. I just got finished up with a great conversation with Patrick Manning. He's the managing partner of Reef Capital, who is the mind behind Black Desert Resort. You've probably heard of it. The PGA Tour's latest tournament uh, golf location. The first time in 60 years that Utah has seen a PGA golf tournament being held here, and it's right here in Southern Utah. Make sure you like and subscribe. It, it's really important for us to continue to grow this uh, this group and, and getting out the word of 435 Podcast and, and what we're trying to do is is connect the local citizens with what is happening in a, in a deeper, longer form uh, format. So we hope you enjoy this episode. Like and subscribe. November is Diabetes Awareness Month. And if you've heard from other episodes, we're raising money for the Washington County Diabetic Youth Association. I'm try- I have a goal of raising $10,000 for the young kids in our community that are diagnosed with this difficult disease. My son has type 1 diabetes, and the Washington County Diabetic Youth Association uh, sends kids to camp. They uh, raise awareness around diabetes and looking for signs because every few years somebody dies uh, without a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. So we want to raise awareness around it. So if, if you have a heart, you want to donate to the local Diabetes Awareness uh, Foundation, the Washington County Diabetic Youth Association is the one to do it. You'll You'll find the link in the comments. Hope you guys enjoy this episode of the 435 Podcast. We really appreciate your support, and uh, we'll see you guys out there. Hey, everyone. The St. George election this year is incredibly important. Go to votestg.com to see who's running and what they stand for, or visit us at our voter booth at Digby's Market, Red Rock Bicycles, or down in the park. If we're talking to Southern Utah, Mm-hmm. They, I've got the most, not mostly, sorry, the the, the NIMBYs, mm-hmm. and then I talk up up north, and everybody loves it. It's a, this huge buzz, and they can't wait to get. So there's yeah. more excitement in northern Utah than there is southern Utah. Yeah, well, I mean, so going back to the beginning, uh, from the idea, this has been like a 20 year in the making idea. Not maybe not necessarily where it's at right now, but the original thought, at least from what the way I understand it, Ivan's Ivan's is a city. Uh, said, hey, we want to maintain our small um, residential community. And the best way for us to um, bring tax revenue into the city would be to uh, lean on our resources that already exist, which are you know Snow Canyon. And they wanted a resort-centered city plan, essentially, right? That's correct. And so they kind of they kind of were evolving as the economy evolved over the last 20 – it was probably 25 years now, right? And this is kind of the culmination of that plan a little bit, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the mayor's called me twice today to ask questions ahead of his uh, recording for the economic summit. Oh, yeah. Um, And uh, yeah, he said, if I could have drafted the general plan for exactly, he actually said, if I hired God to be the third... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the third party consultant to this. Yeah. Um, he said he would have given us Black Desert and he would have changed anything. <laughs> yeah. I, somebody, I, I was up at the um, water symposium. There, there's a water symposium at uh, Utah Valley University. And it was all the state re- uh, representatives. It was mainly like water people talking to the state you know, legislature, right? About you know, hey, where, we're, where are we headed? What are the challenges? Great Salt Lake and then the Colorado River. Mm-hmm. And uh, I sat down and, and somebody said, I can't remember exactly uh, his name, so uh, it, it doesn't matter, but some, somebody that's really important when it comes to you know, these things, he said, it seems like Black Desert has made all of the right, like they've, they've, they haven't missed a single element of this. They, they've gotten every single thing right. Do you feel like that's true? It's like you just, all the dominoes seem to have fallen. Now it's taken a lot, probably a lot longer than the original plan was set up for, but it, do you feel like all the dominoes have kind of just like landed correctly on this? Yeah, I do. Um, we've had 20 years to think about it. Yeah. So so there's a lot of planning that's gone into it. 
But I think if there is anything, you know, we say it's a big resort, but it's a big resort done responsibly. And that mm-hmm. feels good. That feels right. Uh, but there's nothing that compares really in my mind to what we've done right as much as how much we've shown up with the citizenry. Um, I've sat in 150 living rooms and let people just ask questions and suggest changes. And um, we've even amended the, the the master transportation plan to pull a new road that's going to go in. And it was going to go right along the backside of people that live on Mesa Vista. Mm-hmm. And we let that, we amended it to pull it further onto our property away from those property owners, actually creating useless land yeah. for us because but it's the, buffer it, yeah we created more buffer and we did that um and that was as, as, as a suggestion from the residents so we actually get a ton of support from the residents of ivan's even though it's a big big project for a yeah. tiny little town yeah um but they know that we care i mean that's the number one thing that you'll you'll probably hear from me 15 times use the word care um people everybody thinks they care yeah but only if you show up for everybody involved and show the care. Yeah. And, and I noticed that um, early on as I've gotten involved, uh, probably within the last three years, probably just as, as things have started, like you start, you start seeing dirt move and there's more and more, um, you know, city conversations around it, right? You're having to go to actually the city and pull permits and like, you know, start, start putting things down. Um, I've seen you guys post, especially on Nextdoor, but through Facebook and and the amount of, especially to the citizens of Ivan's and Santa Clara specifically, like, hey, this is going to impact them. seems like you've gone above and beyond to reach out to them and make sure that their voice is at least heard because it, it doesn't necessarily mean I, – I think it's important that there's uh, there's a right as a, as a property owner. You get to do what you want with, with what you got, but um, – listening to what everybody feels like are the biggest issues and then taking those into account as you've gone, gone forward. It seems to me like that's, that's happened. And hundred percent. I had everyone say, do not go on next door. Don't do it. Don't do it. You'll be sorry. And I did it. And I'm very glad yeah. because there's a couple people out there that are rude, but for the most part, everybody is appreciative that we show up, we communicate, we answer questions, uh, candidly. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's proven to be the right move for us. Yeah. I think the demographic, um, for whatever the case may be, the demographic seems just in Ivan's is it it's a lot of retirees that are thoughtful with what their concerns are. So it's not a lot of it's not built a lot around emotion. It's it's a lot of history, like just from their own experiences in other towns and things like that. And so anytime I've, I've been in open conversations with people, it's always been uh, like handled with, hey, I appreciate that perspective. We might not necessarily agree, but there's a thought out like comment that gets put together with it and it doesn't really devolve into you know arguing but in facebook for whatever reason it just like instantly goes into like this just disaster of piling on and and saying things that don't make any sense but next door it's just the demographic seems totally different yeah and i also think that um on next door more of the people know each other personally yeah oh yeah yeah more than facebook yeah that's good and point. and so i i think that people behave a little bit better yeah when they know that 15 people are reading what they're saying. And, and then they and see them at the store right. or like down the street. Or, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that I think that's a good point. So so going back, have you been involved with the project from the beginning? Yeah. So I was involved with the project back to 2004. I okay. put it under I put it under contract. Okay. Um, so market the, market was, was popping right yeah, then. Yeah, that's right. It was, it was about to That's right. I, I decided to leave it under contract. I became really good friends with the, um, the eventual seller mm-hmm. of the property. Um he basically said uh, that he'll never sell it to anybody else. Mm-hmm. So I have until his death to close on it. And so um, it was booming and, and 04, 05, 06. And those tiny little towns just could not conceive of this. So the entitlement process was I just kind of hung it up and I decided to go in and partner on the Entrada project. Okay. And so wait for the for the boom to end, I yeah, guess. Yeah. Um, but then there were signs of the recession coming. So I left it under contract again and ride out the recession. And then it, but I worked on entitlements and I worked on things all along the way mm-hmm. and creating the vision, but mm-hmm. we didn't actually close on the property and buy it until 2017. Okay. So then in, in 2017, you, you purchased all 630 acres. I did, yes. So all, all 630 acres and it's uh reef capital is, is the, the investment company, maybe, maybe. So I can explain that because everybody asks me this question. Because I get this, because I get this, uh, I get this comment a lot. It's like, you know, you have these billionaire developers that come in here and they want to do all these things. I was like, I, I don't, I think you're misunderstanding how development really works. Right. You know, there's, there's, there's 
people that do make money in these, but the amount of money that costs on the front end. The risk it, is everything. The risk is so massive, mm-hmm. right? And so, the, you know, the the it's not just some will, somebody willy-nilly with a bunch of money that just is running roughshod over everything. That's not really how it works. So, so maybe help me understand. So when I bought the property, it, I, I bought it and Reef Capital was a lender. Okay. And so um, however much money they loaned me, but um, but about six months later, I noticed how much fun they were having just being around it, being on the periphery of it. And I said, hey, do you guys want to convert your debt to equity and partner with me? Mm-hmm. And they were like, 100%, yes, we mm-hmm. want to do that. And um, and then about a year, or I don't know, however long, six months later again, um, you know, they were taking properties back, unfortunately, that they had loaned money on mm-hmm. and, um, and were asking me to kind of look at them. And then they had some opportunities like the Marcella Mountain uh, that we're doing with uh, the, the um, merger with Deer Valley and okay. Tiger Woods is designing the golf course and all of that. Wow, yeah. Um, so I, I eventually went to them and just said, hey, you know, why don't we like negotiate valuations and just totally create alignment? I'll bring all my assets into Reef. We'll and we'll just all we'll just all be Reef yeah. instead of it's Patrick and Reef. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, yeah. so now we're just it's Reef. We're partners. Uh, yeah. They're both. We both lend ourselves money. Yeah. You know, and we develop it together. Yeah. Which it, at a certain point, once you have enough built in capital to be able to do that, you can you have the opportunity to leverage those assets. So was it always a golf course? Was was the golf yeah. course like the the original? We always had a golf course imagined. Uh, okay. I actually had Tom Fazio. Uh, designed the first course okay and then we scrapped it because it just looked like it was going to be way too hard and then went like to... is is like to play it yes oh, okay yes so um we went with tom weiskopf and uh very glad we did very blessed that he was able to design his last course with us yeah that was his pretty... final course so yeah but it was always intended to be a golf course uh on the property so is, so when you how do you decide if it's hard or not what what's the determining factor on well, you know, how long your it? your drive is your carry over lava how okay. how narrow or or wide the fairways are how yeah. small the greens are how undulated they are yeah just how many bunkers there are just all of those all yeah. of those things come into play yeah and i remember first time we were walking the course with tom somebody said why don't we put a bunker here and he said, well, isn't hitting your ball there punishment enough? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because because so. there's really no left or right. You got to hit it into the green or it's into the black and you never get right, the ball back yeah, again. No. The rare good bounce. <laughs> the ra- yeah, you get the rare good bounce, but the ball's gone forever because right. once it comes back, it's got a big old divot in the, in the side <laughs> sure. of the ball. Yeah. Um, I, and I was lucky enough to play it a couple of times and it is such a beautiful course. So then from the golf course, as it evolved, you know, the surrounding um, – amenities right so so it's 630 acres as a whole which if if looking at it from scale disneyland as it sits right now is 500 acres yep so it's it's bigger than disneyland is as a resort um it's the largest resort in utah by four times four times larger than any other resort in utah and when when you set out was it you were going to develop the whole 630 into all these different pieces or was it like hey we're going to do a golf course and then maybe let's see we need something else to attract how did that kind of evolve well we knew the components of what we're going to go into it we knew there was going to be a resort hotel we knew there was going to be restaurants we knew there was going to be shopping we knew there was going to okay. be a boardwalk but we wanted to give tom a clean slate mm-hmm. and he said i've never gotten something this beautiful and without the constraints that you've already decided where everything's going to go and yeah. I have to like figure out how to fit it in. Yeah. So we let him have a clean canvas. And then when he was done designing the golf course, we decided where everything else was going to go. Okay. So that, that resort, the hotel resort and, and the surrounding amenities, that was already kind of a, a part of it at some capacity. For sure. Yep. So then um, as of right now, as it sits, this, this original phases that are already going vertical, uh, t- give us the details on, you know, like the hotel and the... Sure. And uh, so so um, the resort center is the largest building or series of buildings that you see going up right now. That's uh, 450 rooms of hotel, condo Mm -hmm. hotel, 450 rooms. It's a convention center. Mm -hmm. It's a 15,000 square foot spa that'll be kind of more of a high tech uh, sports medicine type of spa. Yeah. Um, It'll be... uh, Let's see. There's three restaurants in that in that space. Um, Twenty five thousand square foot pro shop and um, uh, all underground parking. Um, and then the golf village is going up as well over by the putting green. 
And yeah. um, all of those will be finished. There's 177, mostly two bedroom uh, hotel rooms over there. Those will all be done. Um, so I'm stumbling here because I'm trying to tell you no, that's when okay. the PGA Tour gets here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, in October. Um, and I can tell you that it's – this isn't – supposed to be public but it's the second week of october not the first week of october which we thought originally which is good you're like i'll take any day yeah i'll take an extra week as many days as i can get (laughs) yeah so when when the pj tour gets here we will have opened 700 plus rooms just two weeks prior pretty much wow 700 rooms the convention center um and all the other things and then five restaurants will be open then Mm -hmm. um so we're only 11 months away from the pga tour and all of that being done which will be which is crazy to think uh when when you look at i mean it's it looks impressive but it doesn't look like it's going to be done in 11 months but it will yeah it's it's kind of like building a house too you're like uh i don't know if they're going to be finished yet they got a lot of stuff left right and we're supposed to be closing in two weeks you're like uh doesn't that's right why is the driveway not even poured yet it's like well the concrete doesn't take that long to cure we get that done it's, <laughs> right. it's got plenty of time yeah. so the golf village is kind of the primary priority just because we the the idea is that it's a you go to the resort and you stay at the resort mm-hmm. right it's yeah. not it's not the idea that you'd be having to travel anywhere you want to be a, it's a, a one place stop right that's right and so um looking at the the plan is in general ha- have you have you been concerned about you know being able to uh, operationally bring in enough labor and things like that? Or do you feel like it's the, what's the field of dreams? Like if you build it, they'll come, you know, is that, is that kind of like that mentality when you look at these big developments? No, no, okay. I, I have a big, a big belief that if you feel you could be creating a problem, it's your responsibility to solve the problem. Okay. A lot of developers don't think that way. They think, I mean, they literally think the opposite and they just say, no, it is not our responsibility to solve our problem. That's the city's, you know, and yeah. it, you just can't, the city can't solve problems like that. Right. Um, they don't have the resources and it's really not even in their purview to solve right. for that. Um, labor is our biggest threat. There's no doubt about that. Mm-hmm. Um, we know we can bring people in uh, to work. We'll have to hire between 2,500 and 3,000 people. That's a ton of people in this market. It's a ton of people. And so we know we have to solve the affordable housing issue. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just trickles back to, you know, you got to solve the housing before you can bring the employees in. Yeah. Uh, but then I'm confident and I'm confident we can solve the affordable housing component. Yeah. Um, so we already have about seven or 800 um, uh attainable housing units that we have uh we have the ground and the entitlements so we've made already made a good a good impact yeah so so thinking about going back to the you have this economic driver for the city why did you decide to go this route like what 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 uh is, is it just the opportunity met met a crossed over or what what is it that's driving you to to do this resort here in ivan's i'm, I'm just curious um, it, it's it's primarily because you you know the land i mean as you know we're the one we're the only place in the united states where three major ecosystems converge and that's yeah. why you've got all the different flora and fauna and geology and colors and it's just a beautiful beautiful spot yeah and then on top of that you have this beautiful spot and then you've got 6 million people a year that are recreating mm-hmm. here tourists and in my opinion there is no there there here. Mm-hmm. So when you come here, where do you go? Right. And I mean, other than you're done at the national parks and no offense to any of the, not meaning to be derogatory about anything, but I don't think people are coming here to then recreate a design outlet mall, for example. Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't have any kind of a sense of community. Yeah. And so the idea was to build the there there. So yeah. you come here, where am I going to go? We have 15, well, eventually we'll have 25 restaurants and 200,000 square feet of retail. And all of that is walkable on cobblestone streets with no cars interrupting because we shove the cars underneath. Yeah, uh, and there's pedestrian bridges uh, that go, that span the, the roadways over the top. So unlike Las Vegas Strip, where you go up the escalator, over the road, down the escalator, here the cars go under. So you yeah. have you don't have any steps, you don't have any escalators, you, it's all totally walkable. And so that was that space, that place where there's outdoor music going at, at night, and it stays open a little later. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not rowdy at all. It's just a fun stroll with shops and restaurants and music. And, yeah. And you, you, you're in this location too that 
truthfully, like there's the, the surrounding neighborhood is pretty far away. That's right? right. I mean, there's, there's a lot of Entrada that kind of buds up against it, but it's still a, a, a second home golf community type. There, there's not as many permanent residents that kind of, you know, butt up against that, that, uh, Southern portion of where it is, all is, but geographically too, like the Ridge and, and everything, it's kind of just set off in its own little Island there, which, which makes it perfectly and ideally located. But taking, taking back, what other projects led you up to this one? Like, was it, is this like the, the culmination of yeah. years of building one resort after another? What, it is. What I've done resorts? about 180 resorts. 180 I did, resorts. I did my first one in uh, St. Augustine Beach, Florida when I was 19 years old. And Dang. have have had, when I came here in 2004, I had 150 going at once. And, um, and I got here and I walked out on the land where Black Desert is now. And I was here just to look at it. I, I, I was living in the Florida Keys at the time. Okay. And I walk out on this thing at two, in 2004, and I, it, it, I'm, I can't, don't know how to describe it other than to say it felt suffocating. Hmm. I felt so strongly I was supposed to sell everything I have, and I'm supposed to be here. Really? And my wife said, why? And I said, I don't know. She said, that's not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but eventually I, I talked her into it. We yeah. moved, moved here within a, about six months later. And uh, now it feels very um, it, right that that uh, it, was, it was good to listen to that inner voice about you're supposed to be here, not commuting. So is it? Have they all been like golf resorts? No, beach, golf, equestrian, okay. um, ski, um, just a little bit of everything. But I've never done anything but resorts. So I've yeah. never done just general housing or anything like that. It's always had a. Um, entertainment, a, yeah, and entertainment and and amenity that was that appealed to to a lot of people, and it's almost always been second home. So, so as you go through those resorts, have you has it always been you kind of like build it up and then you sell it off, or how have you have you kind of gone through that as a business model, right? Sure. You're stacking things up as you go along, but yeah. So basically, what I would do is is build the resort, sell off the condos and real estate or whatever it was, operate a hotel for a while until it stabilized. Um, create a management company, uh, mm -hmm. and then sell that off at whatever time it was right to do something else. And mm -hmm. so uh, when I moved here and put uh, Black Desert under contract, I literally sold every single thing and just said, I'm not supposed to be doing that anymore. Yeah. This this is kind of like the anchor. This is where you want to yeah. build build this long-term one. Is this the biggest one? It uh -huh. sounds like yeah. it is. Yeah. The biggest one, it's, it's probably seven times bigger than anything I've ever built before oh, as wow. far as number of rooms. I mean, I've done bigger acreages, but not bigger resorts. I mean, thinking about going back, you know, back to when you were 19, right? Those early ones, but even from 2004 till now, I can't imagine with like vacation rentals, internet, uh, travelocity, like thinking of how people vacation and travel, you know, what, what are some of those lessons? Like what, what's really changed and, and what have you applied to this resort that might be different from some of those older ones? Um, I think the biggest thing is before it was about, um, it was about ROI. I mean, like really it was about how do you invest the money into this and and get the best return out of it? Mm -hmm. Black Desert's different. Um, I, I jokingly call it a, a whole resort of lost leaders because it's like, okay, well, we, we want to do this in such a way that we will never make any money out of it. But it'll be so cool. And yeah. we do that phase after phase after phase. <laughs> but it's way fun. Yeah. You know? And um, so doing something where it feels like less of a budget or more or less of an ROI and more about – you know, I probably spend half my time thinking about and meeting with people to see how we can affect the community in the state. Yeah. You know, just showing up and being able to say, hey, you know, not to be obnoxious, but there's been times when like Utah Tech has asked us for to do something for them financially. And and it felt big to them at the time of an ask. But literally, it's like a rounding error at Black Desert because it's so big. It's just yeah. like you don't even notice it. Yeah. So it's it, so being able to do those things has been really rewarding. Yeah, there's there's this element of doing something that matters. That's right. Versus just doing something that it, it that makes sense on paper. And I, I think that you know I can't help but empathize with a lot of those people that have those fears around developers that come in and they're like, oh, they're just trying to, they're just greedy developers. They just want a buck. Because at at a big capacity, you're 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 weighing these risks. Is is I have the ability and the interest in doing it. And at the, at the end of the day, I, I want to be made whole at the end. I don't want to do this at a, at a loss. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. And so, um, but having all the experience you had, you're able to take a little bit more of these risks on, on some of these loss leaders. What's the, what's the biggest one where you're like, 
man, this, this doesn't make any financial sense, but this, this thing has to happen this way. Is there, is there one on this project that sticks out Well, to you? yeah. I mean, we, the boardwalk is going to be really crucially important. It's a heartbeat of Black Desert. That's where, you know, you'll have 2 million people strolling on that boardwalk, enjoying the restaurants and shops and music and all of that. That was impossible to build, meaning financially, not viable. Um, because it requires putting the equivalent of four super Walmart parking lots underground and building the boardwalk on top of it. That, I can tell you, would be – we would lose probably $100 million doing that. So the city approved our public infrastructure district, and we were able to pay for those parking garages. And what the city got out of it, they, they gave up nothing. They just right. said, okay, you can do it. Mm -hmm. They gave up nothing. They risked nothing. But in return, what they got was the boardwalk. And the, all the revenue that will be captured from that. Mm -hmm. So, But otherwise, this is a totally different resort without the city stepping up and allowing us to use the tools that the state have made available. Yeah. The geology seems so fascinating, too, is like being able to do that in that spot. Like I can't help but think, did you did you start digging and be like, uh, we didn't think this was right here. Have, have you had to make any of those adjustments? Very small from the ones. Infrastructure side. Very small ones. We had tons and tons of geotech done, so we knew pretty much what we were dealing with before we broke ground. The really cool, another satisfying thing, is that we have had zero import or export of material. So we, oh, that's cool. so we blasted where we, and we, sur I mean, if you come out, you've seen it. Mm -hmm. We surgically put that golf course in there. We didn't nuke anything that wasn't going to be green yeah. or a cart path. Yeah. And um, so when we blasted the rock and we p stockpiled the rock, um, and then at the same time, we're stockpiling the rock that came off the golf course because we're over excavating to put soil in. Mm -hmm. We went over and where the parking garages are going, we dug out all the sand that's great soil for, uh, for the golf course. And and the sand that we needed was the exact amount that came out of the parking garages for wow. the golf course. And then the the rock that came off the golf course was the exact same right amount for the construction fill, road base, walls around the resort, that wow. kind of thing. So we, I always just say God was like this close to getting the golf course right. Yeah, just, just, <laughs> just this close to nailing. He could have just had that golf course to start. So that, that – uh accounting for some of that reuse stuff is that is that anything you take into account on the front end is is it you're like hey i'm going to reuse some of these materials is that pretty typical reusing a lot of that stuff or yeah i mean it, it's not atypical it's it's just it just never seems to work out that way you yeah, either have a huge perfectly. export and it's a big cost or it's a huge import and it's a big cost yeah we were just very fortunate that that wasn't something that was a it was a it was a good curveball yeah that is a <laughs> that's a cool one so so thinking think it through um you know, this being this capital project, and then now it's kind of led way to a few other big golf resort type stuff with the PGA and Tiger Woods doing another course up there. What are, what are some of the lessons that you learned early on in that marketing side to to really make this something unique? Do you think it just sold itself, or was there something specific about this project that help help you get it over to that? Because you need you almost I guess you didn't really need those big names, but that's where that domino falling into the into place to where you're like this this can solidify any of the economic roles right. that p potentially might come our way um maybe maybe walk me through that sales that sales side of things on as, you know, uh, these big organizations as far as getting like the pga tour here um i don't know if you saw i think you were there at the press conference mm -hmm. for that and governor cox said we've been working on this for 20 years it turns out we didn't have to do anything yeah um because we didn't ask for any help. We didn't ask for the state to come in and help pitch the pitch the PJ Tour to come. Um, I The PJ Tour not only gave us a tour spot on the FedEx Cup, with, but they also uh, have been really working with us on the schedule and getting us in at the right spot. And um, I one day said, was why I, I, I feel like I know why you gave us a PJ Tour stop, but why it, it seems important to you. And they said that, there's nowhere on the PGA Tour where all of the players and caddies and everybody can stay on the resort, and then they can have their own player dining. Like, we're going to give them their own 14,000-square-foot restaurant. Nobody else can go in there. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, child care. Edu we're putting up, you know, school, if you yeah. will, for yeah, just yeah. a week. Um, so the, the players never have to leave, and if they're not on the course, they, there's no fan interference, if you will, in there just off – behind or outside the ropes experience inside the ropes um it's really highly uh d designed awesomely for the fan yeah but when the players aren't on the course they're not playing they've mm -hmm. got privacy yeah 
Let's see, and that and that was an interesting thing too, because thinking about how tight you know from one hole to the next, and, and a lot of times you just don't even see where any of the other holes are. Like you can be right. on the course and you don't see any of the other holes. I mean, it just literally looks like you're in the middle of the lava flow on every single hole, which I think is right. amazing. Um, so so thinking about that experience for the golfer, that was probably one of the big drivers. Yes, it was. Having Tom but, having done a bunch of designs he probably was thinking about that is that right yeah yeah for sure yeah he he had it in his mind even though we really didn't at the time yeah and it wasn't until somebody said should we get the pga on the phone and i said sure let's do it and they they were out here within a week after hearing what black desert is and what we're building and they wanted to see it and then uh, steve winsloff is in charge of course design and approving courses for the pga tour and we walked it for six hours in the coldest day ever uh windiest day ever it was terrible but he uh, he just said at the Feeling end... Feeling like Scotland. It was probably right, yeah, a yeah. like Scotland. But at the end, Steve said, you know, Patrick, um, this is going to be a PGA Tour stop. And I was like, okay, great. And he said, but, you know, the PGA obviously has um, spectacular courses on the PGA Tour. And we have epic holes. Mm-hmm. But nothing is going to pop on international television like Greater Zion will here with this golf course. Yeah. And that was an awesome statement. He just said, nothing will pop like this. Yeah. Well, and, and the media attention and and just like the echoes, like you were saying just a minute ago, you're walking through, you're in Fort Lauderdale. Is that where mm, yeah, you were? That's right. And people were recognizing the B. Tell me, tell me about the name. Uh, Cause that was a, that was an interesting story. Mm. What share, how'd you come up with the name? Well, so back it seems in, so obvious, but it's yeah. It's back in 04, um, I started calling it Black Rock. Mm-hmm. And that was going to be the name of it. Mm-hmm. And it was Black Rock. It's, it's, people still call it that sometimes because it was f- 15 years it was called Black Rock. Yeah. And then one day, um, before we broke ground, I'm walking the land with Tom Weiskopf, and uh, he bends over and he picks up a Black Rock. Mm-hmm. And he hands it to me and he says, Patrick, what is this? I said, it's a rock. And he said, yes, it is. And this, and he puts his wa- arms wide, up, wide open and he said, this is a desert. I was like, okay, Tom, we'll call it Black Desert That's instead. Cool. <laughs> so, and I like that because it does have this. It, it does have this encompassing feel. It's it's more than just you know. It's more than just the lava flow because the red rock, you know, setting off, you know, the backdrop of it is just going to be insane. Yeah. And, I mean, it is already just with the green and the black and the and the red rock. It's beautiful. I think you got a cool project. It's it's pretty awesome. So, um, tell me a little bit about. Um, I know a little bit of the infrastructure and what you've done with like low voltage because a big part of Southern Utah is sustainability, right? We get, I get conversations. You, I went to the water symposium, right? Mm-hmm. We, we're always having a conversation about water. They've been having conversations about water since 1870, right? Mm-hmm. Since the time they settled it. Ivan's didn't even have water until like 1910. I didn't even know that because mm. they just couldn't get, they couldn't get water. And so, um, you know, think about the sustainability element. Maybe walk walk somebody through if they don't if they didn't know what sure. what should they know about that and and why this project's important. Well, like I said earlier, we've always uh, I've always said it's not enough to just be big. Mm-hmm. It's big done responsibly, mm-hmm. and um, it, obviously, water and power were two big things uh, for us uh, early on. So we looked all around the world at trying to find the best technologies to conserve water and conserve energy. And um, so we'll be the largest resort in the world powered over low voltage. So instead of running uh, 120 to all of your mm-hmm. light fixtures and your door locks and your cameras and all the stuff, um, the reason a light bulb is hot is when it's on is because it's there's a, something called a rectifier above it that takes that 120 volt and dissipates it into the air. In other words, he wastes it. Yeah. And uh, because the light bulb can only handle 10 volts or it'll blow up. Yeah. And, so, then, and then we have these LEDs. They don't take that much charge. But right. because the the voltage system that we've put everywhere. That's right. It, it, it doesn't necessarily. We just, we just waste that. That's right. Yeah. So now we're running Cat6 cable through the whole project and only running, only sending 10 volts. So the light bulb will actually be cold because they're not wasting any That's electricity. Awesome. And they'll probably last the life that they're supposed to last. Like I have LED bulbs and they don't, they don't last. <laughs> they say like 30 year life is like, yeah, if you weren't you know, overloading it a hundred percent of the time, then they, they blow out because they right. just can't handle that that much. So that sustainability. I thought that was really uh, interesting. And, and there was a, a grant or something that you were able to. Yeah. To pull so, for that? so there's a uh, funding available uh, that's, that's called CPACE mm-hmm. and it's, it only, you can only borrow the money or get the money, the funding on items that are above code. Like you're going over and above uh, on your water, on your energy efficiency, your water conservation, your seismic, all of those things. And a lender has to hire 
um, a third party energy has has to get an energy audit done mm -hmm. by a third party. And so that third party came in and looked through all of our books, all of our drawings, all of our stuff, and um, and let let everybody know what we've been doing. And um, we're actually spending two hundred million dollars more than we would be required to spend on those same items. And that resulted in us getting the largest CPACE funding in the history of the world with 153 million. It broke the old record by 50 million dollars. Wow. So, so like th thinking about that sustainability side of, of taking extra, you're over, over, going over and beyond beyond what necessarily is required because it's that this project's that important. It is. It's important for it to be done responsibly. And like, yeah. like the there's a sin word sometimes when I say that we have a water park, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, and um, but <laughs> that doesn't go over well here in Southern Utah very often, right? But but our water park, we're doing it in in such a way, and we we hired. Cloud H2O that did Atlantis. Mm -hmm. And the way we're doing that with regenerative media and everything else is that we're we're actually going to use half the water if, that if we would have put quarter acre residential lots on that same footprint. So yeah. we're actually using less water to, to have for a water park than quarter acre lots would use. I, and I, I hear this all the time, too, is there's this argument that, uh, you know, we need to keep uh, a, a lower density development. And part of it's because we have less people here, we would use less water. But the idea is what ends up ultimately a developer comes in and they put houses in there. It's, it still uses water, even if it's it might not necessarily be on grass, but it's still trees and mm -hmm. and any of the landscaping that most people really want, right? Plus, they got to use it inside, so that's that's interesting. So it's like half the the amount of water usage. Yeah. Is that what you said? And then our, our golf course uses half of what if we put if we had just put quarter acre lots out there. Yeah, and, and so the golf course actually conserves water, which I know the, the other argument is, well, don't build anything. But, yeah. but that's not realistic. That's not going to happen. You you know, we yeah. we are. I mean, you said six hundred thirty acres. Out of that 630, we're preserving through a conservation easement almost 300 acres. Mm -hmm. So we are setting aside about half the property that will never be built on. And we're putting public trails through it and nature center. And we're paying for all of it. And mm -hmm. we're paying to maintain it, even though we're giving it away to the city of Ivins and Santa Clara so that everybody can enjoy it for generations. And so... You know, if you're only building on half your property and you're doing the rest, the the other fifty percent responsibly. What I, else could you expect? Yeah, I just don't. I don't. I, I feel like we're doing it right. Yeah, you're you're doing you're doing all of the things right in terms of saying, hey, we know that growth is an inevitable. It's it is a it's a constant, especially for the the community that we live in, and doing it in such a way that's as responsible as we can make it. That uh, there's a winner. There's a win-win scenario in in and what this project ultimately is going to be, because I think it's going to be kind of a, a, a little gem for Southern Utah. It's going to be this, this uh, thing that, you know, is going to make us proud and people that live here are going to be able to take advantage of it, even yep. though it's not a private course and it's probably going to be booked a lot, That's right. but it's still going to be a public course. That's at least right. The community is going to be able to use it. Right. If you remember uh, when you did the podcast with uh, Governor Cox before uh -huh. he got inaugurated, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was on there with a couple other people and, and uh, governor actually said, you know, Patrick, I've been following black desert and what black desert is going to be is Utah's resort. Yeah. He's like, because we don't identify as much like with the park city. Cause that doesn't feel like it's our people. Yeah. Interesting. But Southern Utah is our people and this will be our resort. And I, I love that. And I took that to heart and that's why we, I want, you know, I don't want uh, the residents around here to say they have a PJ court tour. I yeah. want them to say we have a PJ tour. Yeah. You know, I that may that. be dreaming, but that's what I want. I want everybody to take ownership of this. Well, that extends to uh, the partnership with Utah Tech, right? And it yep, being the, the right. course for the college as well. Maybe tell, tell tell me a little bit more about that. So how did that come about? Has, yeah. that, has that kind of been in the back of your mind or was it? No, it wasn't. It was, you know, as I told you, I'm always in, out in the community asking to see how we might be able to help. And I, I actually approached um, Utah Tech about, I, I said, we need help. Mm -hmm. Can you create an, a hospitality, robust hospitality program so that we, you can feed us yeah. the, the people that we need to run this resort with us? And uh, it took one meeting. That's amazing to me. One meeting, they said yes. So help us build the curriculum. That's awesome. We'll roll it out in the fall. And they've already rolled it out. And they've already got people enrolling in it, yeah. uh, kids enrolling in it. And, um, and then I said, well, what can I do for you? And uh, and they were, said, well, our golf teams don't have a home. They literally don't have a place to play. They don't have a place to practice. I was like, well, that's easy. So we we got them some land and built them a, a practice facility. And 
And with Black Desert and what it is as a resort and having a PGA and LPGA tour um, and having their practice facility, they literally now have the best um, foundation or a home course of, of anyone in Division One golf in the NCAA. There's nobody has something bigger and better. That's and, awesome. And so we really support support them as part of our community. And that, and that's cool too because uh, if we if we followed the the football team this last season, uh, that that side of things is not going very well. But it sounds like the golf golf has a lot of opportunity in that. But um, that's cool. I like I like that partnership. And and I think that's important for um, you know Utah Tech and whether it was Dixie State or Utah Tech or whatever that college has been, it's always kind of been this institution where, you know, we were training talent to leave right. Southern Utah. And now there's all these opportunities to where now, you know, kids can start there and then there's a place for them to go almost immediately after just right. and stay here in Southern Utah. It's an integral part. So And hospitality isn't, I mean, people think of it as like we need, we need servers, which we do. We want yeah. to take really good care of the servers and yeah. everything. But there's also, there's hospitality legal and hospitality accounting and hospitality. I mean, it's a niche yeah. that there there's like 300 disciplines that it's are It's a very be... difficult business model too. There's not a huge profit margin when it comes yeah. to a lot of that hospitality stuff. Sure. And you got to do it the right way. So having, having that education through it, I think is really important. Yeah. Um, what, are there going to be any hospitality like, uh, you know, I think of like the Ritz and the Four Seasons and things like that. Have you gone through like, hey, these are these are some of these things that are going to make us unique for us as a resort when people come and visit? Is there going to be anything like that? Have you thought through any of that? Well, I think that, yeah, I mean, we'll have our, you know, I mean, it's it's usually the small stuff that makes a difference, not the mm-hmm. huge stuff. I mean, yeah. the water park is a huge thing. The a PGA course is a huge thing. Mm-hmm. But just having the – a. Uh, a really, really good, well done lemonade that people get when they're checking in. They're, you know, they're just yeah. greeted. It's things like that are going to be resort wide. Yeah. Um, the reason why you don't see a brand, mm-hmm. and not that we didn't interview a ton of them, mm-hmm. um, the brands just wanted to do it their way. Yeah. And we have a way we want to do it. We, and you're talking hospitality brands. Yes. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. You know, whatever it is, Ritz, yeah, yeah. Marriott, whatever it is. Yeah. And we talked to probably 30 of them, mm-hmm. but none of them spoke the language that showed a level of care for the person checking in and needing to get their car out of LA. And they just weren't, they, when we told them the, what we want the experience to be there, it's like, yeah, that doesn't pencil. I'm like, I don't even care. Yeah. The pencils. I, I want to do it because it's right. And it's good. And we're the host. Yeah. They should, you know, we shouldn't invite them to come here if we're not going to treat them the way that they should be treated. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Well, and that, and that's tough too. Cause I, I know you've, you've wanted to kind of keep the, the resort as a whole, um, the restaurants you don't want, you know, you're not trying to get uh, Bubba Gump shrimp in there is like one of these or, you know, Cheesecake Factory and things like this where these, you know, big resorts typically have these big franchise type uh, brands there. Yep. You're trying to stay away from that, right? That's right. We're going to go. We'll have great restaurants, fantastic restaurants. I just we just don't I don't people talk about an anchor. I don't mm-hmm. want an anchor. Mm-hmm. I don't want, you know. I don't want Cheesecake Factory. I'm sorry for listeners who love Cheesecake Factory. Yeah, yeah. But I don't want it. And so we'll have uh, we'll have a rocking, awesome Mexican restaurant that'll be just nice. killer. We'll have an awesome German beer garden type of mm-hmm. restaurant that'll be awesome. And we'll, I want to do a two story um, uh, brew pub and make it maybe an Irish pub. And nice. And so there's just a lot of fun things. And then you know, and then you've got malt shops and candy shops, and you know, so there's there's stuff for everybody. Yeah. That uh, on the boardwalk. I've kind of got a little bit of the, it's not loud, but a little bit of the more lively and mm-hmm. then a little bit more of the family friendly on the other side. And and they, they totally good for everybody to walk all over the place. Yeah. It's just that you can kind of choose your journey. Yeah. That's awesome. That's cool to kind of think through and be able to master plan that out. Yeah. Uh, so you told me one other thing too, and I want to touch on this is just uh, some kind of venue. Is it, This is an additional piece to this is down the road a little ways, right? That's right. So, so tell me a little bit about that venue. Well, I'll tell you what it what it what it is. I mean, it's like knowing your audience. Mm-hmm. If, if I'm talking to your audience, I probably tell them about the concert venue and and all of that. Um, when I'm talking to my bank, I'm telling them I'm building a very big convention center. Yeah, because I can sell that all day long, and they know that. Yeah, but that convention center also has just like the Delta Center seats that pull out, and they then you have a, a full on concert venue that that actually is the same size as the lower bowl of the Utah Jazz of the Delta Center. And um, 
so I want to be able to pull in big concerts for the PGA Tour, mm -hmm. and I want to be able to. We have a deal with the Jazz that hasn't been totally disclosed on what that deal is yet. Mm -hmm. um, but let's just say we want to have the Jazz do their preseason games. Yeah, did they, did, isn't there like uh, their box seats are like the black Black Desert? Uh, oh well, that's up there. Yeah, so, yeah, up up at already. So you kind of already have a little bit of a partnership with the Jazz we do. up there. We now. have a, we have a big partnership. So yeah. I like to summarize the partnership with the Jazz and say you're going to start seeing a lot more Black Desert mm -hmm. at the Delta Center. Yeah, and you're going to see a lot more of the Utah Jazz down at Black Desert. Yeah, and so they're they're intending to spend. Uh, they being the uh, players and coaches are planning on spending the off season at Black Desert. And kind of just hanging out and chilling with their with their VIP members, if yeah, you will. Yeah. And so they all spend time instead of they're just at a box suite watching a game. They're actually out there playing golf and dining and going to the water park with the players and coaches and stuff. Yeah, that's cool. And so, and then flip side, uh, the Jazz Arena, all the LEDs all turn to Black Desert. You know, every six minutes or something like that. That's cool. And then. Um, we have the Black Desert Club Lounge there now, the mm -hmm. VIP Lounge. Oh, that's right. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, and it it turned out really good. We're still working on it. And we've got big, big fourteen foot photographs of some of the best golf shots on uh, on Black Desert in the concourse. Oh, cool. Um, as you're making your way to the seats and stuff, so um, it's a it's a fun relationship, and we're yeah. working on something like that with the Raiders and the Vegas Knights too. Yeah. So, like, th thinking of this as you know, it starts with golf as like this uh, centerpiece. But there's a lot of flexibility for it to be a sports center, right? Because, you know, we're known for our outdoor, you know, we have uh, the Red Bull Rampage out in Virgin. We have, you know, the marathons. We have Ironman. We have all these outdoor stuff. You know, it seems like this is a transition. To, now you're getting into some of the more classic uh, sports, you know, the, the yeah. typical big sports um, uh, interests are all going to kind of reside right here. That's kind of a, right. a little bit of the vision of it, right? Yeah. And yes, for sure. And in we want to have a little bit of an indoor outdoor experience. So the, the roof retracts so you cool. can have it be open, but then also f cool fan experience, whether there's a concert or there's a Utah jazz playing a preseason game there, there's a hotel that wraps around the entire oval, if you will, of the arena. So that if you, if you have a hotel room and you walk out on your balcony, you've got balcony, like sweet seats, if that's you cool. will, uh, for whatever's happening at the, at the, uh, at the, uh, arena. That's, that reminds me of like Chicago, like the, the Cubs, right. Where you can mm -hmm. like stay in the, in the surrounding areas and watch the Cubs game out the back, back of your, your hotel room or, or you know, I think those are like residences really mainly they, they right. live right there just watching it right out the gate. So that's, that's a pretty cool experience. I, I mean, it's a big vision. Um, I, I, I'm excited about it being here. I could see why a lot of people are, are nervous about how that's going to change the environment uh, mm -hmm. of Southern Utah. Um, uh, are you um, th thinking of this as a long-term project, you know, how much longer before you would say this thing's fully completed out? I would say the whole, whole of Black Desert is probably done in seven or eight years. And it, eight years. yeah, we'll have, we'll have a third of it built in 11 months. Yeah. Um, the rest of it is going to take a little bit longer just because we haven't even begun design on some of the stuff in Santa Clara and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But um, it's it'll be finished somewhere between five and eight years. Yeah. Well, it's coming up fast. Yeah, it is. Five fast. years comes fast. Your 11 months is coming up fast. That's coming really fast. What can I What can I do to help? What, what do I need? <laughs> you get me out there with a can, hammer? Yeah. I need, yeah. I need every, all hands on deck. All hands on deck. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for coming on, man. I don't, I don't have uh, – um, I don't have any worries that this thing isn't going to be really big. And I think it's going to be great for Southern Utah. Um, I know that you've gone above and beyond with the trying to make it responsible for, for what this development is. And um, we're already on the map. So we might as well have a resort that uh, allows people to come here and land here and, and enjoy it that much more. So that's it. Well, uh, anything else you want to leave me with? Is there any other uh, little Easter eggs or anything? Uh, no, but if uh, you want to you wanna ping me in a couple of months, I'll have a couple more things okay, to share. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stay in touch <laughs> with you. But thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. All right. It. Thanks, Robert.